okay what date is it 29th of july 29th of july uh real-time working group uh we i would say weekly meeting it's more like a monthly meeting now um okay so we thought we'd start with a demo so heinrich do you want to give it a go yeah sure let me share my screen So can you see the screen right now? Yeah, so <laughs> this is some test issue I made on dev.gitlab.org. A lot of activity so, on this issue. <laughs> yeah, you could like, uh, so one thing that used to not work was when you assigned an issue to someone using quick actions, it wouldn't show up here on the sidebar because we don't do some special JavaScript to do it and we don't update these in real time. So yeah, now if you do this, you should see it update instantly. And the same thing happens if we like open a new tab here. If we unassign this user here, it should you know, update here. Love it. <laughs> it's a great, it's a fantastic feature. Especially since like sometimes um, you, you are still editing the MR description and you use the label command or something, uh, but then danger kicks in and auto assigns labels. So whatever you will do, you will then undo the work danger did like while you were updating the MR description or otherwise updating the issue or MR. So this is really great. Yeah, it helps with these uh, like multi value fields on the sidebar because you kind of override like some others values right because we send like the complete list of new values so that works for assignees which are like multiple assignees and labels yeah yeah it's really awesome it's also just really nice to see the feature working after all this time and with all the effort that's gone into it so um thanks a lot uh, I'll be back in one second. Yeah, sure. um, go, go ahead without me first. Yeah, no worries. Um, so yeah, I had a couple of questions, Heinrich. Um, we mentioned before about the possibility of, like in order to consider this like shift as a feature, we'd normally have to have the feature flag defaulted to on or removed entirely. So I mentioned in a couple of meetings ago about, um, the possibility of having, instead of a feature flag, having the, whether action cable is configured be the condition upon which the feature is shown or not. Um, what do you think of that? Does that sound reasonable or is that a really bad idea? Yeah, I was thinking about this and then we wanted to keep the feature flag, right? Because, you know, when we deploy to gitlab.com, like we want to, you know, stagger maybe and just send updates or, you know, just enable connections without sending the updates and, you know, uh, that sort of thing. So I was thinking maybe we could do, we could make the condition something like action cable in app or feature that enabled something, right? So if it's enabled in app, meaning self managed instances, and they enabled it on Omnibus, then the feature would be enabled regardless of the feature flag. But for .com, where we want to do standalone, um, yeah, it depends on the feature flag. I think you know that's like a compromise. Although I don't know, we do, do we need to document on Omnibus? Like, if you enable in app, it enables this feature. <laughs> if you do standalone, you'd have to enable the feature yourself, or like, is this like sort of an internal? It's gonna be temporary, right? Anyway, so it's like. Yeah, it's temporary. And then also, uh, yeah, I see the, I see the problem, but then we're not really, we don't really have to document it at all. I don't think for anyone who's not going to use it in app at the minute and we can just address that later. Yeah, because I guess we could add it because definitely we have, we have to add like a feature doc, right? About like mm -hmm. side sidebar is real time or something. 
And then we could just add a small note there that this feature is enabled by default when action cable in app is enabled or something like that, right? I think that's yeah enough. Yeah, and then we keep the feature flag. We'd also need the we'd need either of those two conditions to work, right? Because later down the line, if you are deploying with a standalone server and you switch the feature on, then it has to work. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so I could make the feature check some conditional like that, like in app or feature that enabled. So it will be enabled by default for in app users. Cool. Anyway, in Omnibus in app isn't like enabled by default. So this shouldn't like immediately break installs or some, or, you know, or anything. They should still like explicitly enable it. So. Um, just while we're on that, actually, what what's what was the process to get this um, working on on dev.gitlab.org specifically? Like, did was there a, a chart that had to be updated to configure this for that? Uh, cookbooks. Um, basically, two MRs were needed. Yeah. Uh, at first, I didn't know, so I had to like uh, ping infra folks and like. Yeah, and Marin pointed me to the repos. And there's a chef cookbook for configuring our instances. Then there's another repo for like the specific configs for the sh that uses that chef cookbook to configure our instances. And that's where I put the in app true and you know, stuff. Yeah. Okay, cool. I was just curious. And then, um, so the, the other point I had here was about we mentioned in the last meeting about getting QA involved. Um, and I know Gabe mentioned that he would talk to Q. I don't know if he's, if he's done that, but like, this is the point probably at which like the latest point at which we should like inform them, um, of what we're doing, um, our plan to release this. So this, that should probably be done before we enable the feature in, in the way we just mentioned, like conditionally on the configuration, cause that's going to switch the feature on for everyone. So we should probably get docs involved as well. Um, to help write the documentation for customers. So I guess just an FYI, but I don't know. Do you know if like any QA work has been done on this so far? I don't think there is any, you know, QA work that's already been done because we haven't really like um, talking to them or like mentioned to them or something. But yeah, I'm not sure what, um, we do have like feature specs for it. Um, but I guess we want some end-to-end -end tests maybe. Yeah, I can't think of how this would affect any existing end-to-end -end tests unless we're doing some tests around quick actions, for example. Um, I don't know how it would break anything, any existing... Content. Yeah, it wouldn't break anything, but you know, the only concern there is if QA wants to add new ones, right, to verify this behavior. Yeah, yeah we, we did, <clears throat> excuse me, we, we did loop in grant. Um, Last thing I remember, because I think it came up in the previous meeting or the one before as well, is that he said we are not currently set up to run tests that do these kind of that test these light interactions very well. So, so yeah, I think it wasn't immediately clear, like how we would do that and test it in an automated fashion. So, so that that is the last thing I I heard about it. So I don't think we have anything in, in place yet. Yeah, that's for performance tests though. And like end-to-end -end tests are a different thing, which are like really like live interactions. But yeah, so it's I think it's possible there. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. I had another question about so my understanding of because we talked a little bit about how in which order we should you know enable this so to make it available to to users. Um, so I mean, usually the way uh, we roll out features. Uh, we don't we don't really communicate wi widely that this is a thing and, and until the feature flag has already been lifted basically right so that we're really sure you know it's there it's working for everyone uh, so so I'm wondering but we're not not at this stage yet right so I'm wondering like to what extent we should even like start advertising this uh, and also and may maybe that's like a maybe that needs to be discussed separately but I'm wondering um, for uh, for dot com. Um, so we've only deployed it to, to dev, but do we at this point want to split the delivery for self-managed and .com entirely in the sense that we want to just keep testing on, on dev, but like not even intend to roll it out 
uh, on dotcom anytime soon, or do we want to do do both? Like, is like one the prerequisite for the other? Like, kind of saying that, or oh, before we want to ship it for everyone, we want to make sure it works on dotcom. So, so, so those are things that are not entirely uh, clear to me yet. I don't. Uh, I don't know. Like, the the purpose of shipping something to you know. Uh, it, sorry, shipping something to small cluster and single instance customers was just to get something out the door, demoable, um, and provide sort of some value to someone. Whether or not we want to actually make a, a big deal out of it until it's available in other environments, I don't know. I actually would probably defer to Gabe on that one and see what he wants to do about it. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Also, yeah, we I probably think, don't sorry. want it on release post, maybe, because it's not, you know, like usually we add to re release post when it's like default enabled or like we tested in some way already, right? So probably not release post, but also the problem with not advertising it anywhere or saying anything about it is like it's no use, right? Nobody could use it and nobody could give feedback. And yeah, so I'm not sure if Gabe has a like short list of customers or users that were like interested in something like this and maybe they may be the first ones to try it or something. But, yeah. I think as well, um, I'm not sure the exact statistic, but I think it's somewhere around 20 to 30% um, of self-hosting self customers report telemetry data or report usage ping. So it's not, you know, it's not, we're not going to collect a, a huge amount of data from from this like so yeah there was also something came up in a retrospective on the plan team about possibly using secondary items in the release post to announce features like this that are shipping to i guess in this case it would be a cohort of customers rather than the entire customer base but um yeah i'll ask gabe to come in on that async because that's really i guess something he would want to have an input on uh, but it's a good question and um, just to clarify, so so assuming like we would be happy with uh, how it's working currently, uh, and we would be looking at uh, communicating it um, to to customers, um, do we have a feeling already for like what what the next steps are? Then like would be uh, like how far away would we be from from dot com support as as well? Is is that now like a tool? Because I, I do remember we decided okay, let's focus on self managed first, and it makes makes perfect sense, but. I'm just wondering, like, how is it now a totally different uh, initiative, or will that be just uh, definitely the next the next step here? <laughs> uh, yeah. So I have a, a, a short update in the agenda just on what I can see for what the delivery team are working on. Um, it seems like the web sockets work has been moved into in progress, and they're actually working on it, which is awesome. They're going to focus on uh, what is it, the online terminal that's used in CI pipelines to debug jobs and things like that, that actually all is already set up to use WebSockets. And they already write that traffic through HA proxy in a particular way. So they're going to start by supporting that um, WebSocket socket traffic. And then I believe the next thing is Action Cable. So if that's, in, that's more or less actually exactly to the estimate that they gave us. So we can like sort of assume that Things will go to plan there. I would expect, like in the couple in a couple of milestones, hopefully, um, that work for .com will really start to ramp up. But you're right that it is kind of unless we were to, I suppose, find that this has a seriously low impact on, um, on uh, you know, deployment on the same node. I don't see how we can do on .com without a standalone. Without you know a separate deployment of standalone and through Kubernetes and everything. That's actually a really good segue into the next point because like of course I'm curious like where I can help out more at this point. So maybe that's probably more simple for you, Henrik, and me to to figure out like um, because I'm curious as well. <clears throat> of course, um, I don't know if you've looked at anything already, and I'm not even sure how uh, the how how like. Um, uh, how sensible the dev .gitlab net uh, data is to look at because we can't really compare that to too much else i suppose because it's a very constrained environment right but i'm i'm so curious just to see in general like if we already have a feeling for like where we landed on like things 
like resource usage? Is, is that anywhere in the ballpark of what we had anticipated it would be, or is it much better or much worse? So, so that's maybe something we can we can look at together uh, as the next step. Yeah, I haven't looked into. I'm sure. I'm pretty sure we have like Grafana chart or something about the resource um, usage of Dev, right? And I think the current expectation for us is like there should be very little to no change, right, with the in-app mode uh, in terms of memory and um, in terms of CPU. But still, it's a very low traffic instance, so <laughs> probably you know can't really conclude anything there. But, yeah. Yeah. Actually, now that you mention it, um, I, I don't do. Do we do, do we have dashboards for dev and ops and all these secondary? I don't think we do. I think we have for staging and prod, but I, I don't think we actually have any dashboards either. So yeah, uh, I, I'm not even sure like what we typically use dev for because we don't use it for things like performance tests, right? I, I think we use ephemeral environments for performance tests. As far as I as, as far as I know, I think that's what the QNG team does. Um, they spin up these GCP instances and use them for things like load tests and so forth, and then they spin them down again before clustering. Um, it's just a legacy thing. We used to do security development on dev, and then, okay. yeah, it's right now just used for our, as an OAuth provider. We okay. use our dev accounts, you know, to log into some services like I think Sentry and like uh, other stuff, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Uh, all right, let, let's just see if, if there's anything we, we can dig up. We, like, hmm. yeah, so does that mean we're not even, so, okay, we might not have Grafana dashboards, but we, do we, I wonder if we even have anything, like if, 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 if Prometheus is scraping these services at all, it might not be. That's something to look into, I guess. Yeah. I wonder as well okay. about, you know, we won't get this data from, from the dev environment, but I do kind of have this sneaking suspicion that we'll see fewer page requests, like full page requests. As like the more features we ship on the sidebar, the fewer times you have to refresh the page to see who's assigned, to see what labels are attached, to see when the due date is. You know, you can't, it's not something that's gonna be easily quantifiable, but you know, do we have it also happens only software? after the user knows, right? If if the user doesn't know, even mm -hmm. if the feature is there and the user doesn't know, and then you know, <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, I also true. wonder, um, do we what kind of metrics do we have for self managed? Because uh, one of the bigger uh, like epics I've been working on for the past two months actually, we're, we're about to uh, we've shipped a bunch of stuff and we're about to kind of conclude. We're like in the last, <laughs> you know, on, on, the, on the the last mile now, but um. So we started to track uh, topology data for self-managed into uh, into SciSense via usage ping, so that we get a better idea of like how customers deploy GitLab. Um, uh, so currently, it only works for single node, but we we are looking right now into expanding it into multi node as well. Uh, but it, yeah, so we we're kind of curious, like what kind of GitLab services do they do they run? Uh, how much memory do they consume? Uh, how 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 does their uh, node hardware look like? You know. You know, like how many CPUs, how much memory do they, do they have? Um, and we also want to use this data to map the spectral reference architectures to see how closely our customers follow our recommendations. Uh, but yeah, long story short, I'm, now I'm thinking if, there's, if we could use that uh, to somehow also get a bit more insight into action cable related stuff. It might be tricky just because it is embedded, because we kind of currently only track on a service level. So it would all kind of disappear behind what we call web, <laughs> right? Which is just the Rails app, basically. Um, but yeah, but I can think about this a little bit more. It might might be might be good because we can we can you know because we can performance test this here all all day long. But at the end of the day, uh, all that counts is like how it will perform uh, for the customer, right? Uh, so that's that's exactly why we're doing this um, to get a bit more insight into that. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And I think the, you know, the best case there would be like not seeing any change, right? Or, you know, just, you know, and <laughs> the only thing that's worrying would be if we see a big jump somewhere after they enable the feature or, yeah. But right now we don't track in usage ping though the <coughs> action cable um, in-app, you know, setting. So maybe we just add that and combine that with the metrics that your memory team is already working on, like the resource stuff. So that would be that, useful. That, 
definitely sounds like a very good idea. We should probably do that, yeah. Because that will give us an idea. Because what we could then do is we could write an ETL that kind of breaks down uh, yeah, what we call the web deployment, the web service, by has action cable enabled and does not have action cable disabled, uh, enabled. And uh, then we could see, does it, does it have any bearing on like things like service memory use? We don't have many metrics. Like it's still a very sparse model right now. So we really only have memory consumption. And I'm, like, as I speak, I'm, I'm working on uh, getting CPU and memory utilization as well, which is like the, yeah, the extent to which like these, the hardware is being used. Uh, but it's all quite coarse grain, you know, we don't have like super like fine grain stuff because usage ping also only runs once a week. Um, so uh, what we do is we just collect data as we go over the course of the week and then we pull these like one week averages just to get this finger in the air estimate. But we do keep like historical stuff, right? Do we? Like, so we could compare like for the same instance before they enabled action cable and after they enabled action cable. I think so. Yeah, I would think so because that data will enter the data warehouse, right? I have no idea what our like data retention uh, policies are. I don't know if that data will be around forever or if they have to delete it after so and so many weeks. So, so that I, I can't speak to that. But um, generally, I would think that we yes keep keep some some uh, some degree of history should be should definitely be there. Yeah. Um, we had an item here just that I added about, uh, Heinrich, you asked the question about enabling in-app mode for Cloud Native GitLab. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure because I, I don't have the information I need. I don't know where uh, Cloud Native GitLab is actually deployed. I know it's used in CI CD pipelines, but apart from that, do you know where this project is used? Like, is it the basis? It will be used for the Kubernetes thing, right? Yeah, but um, yeah. It, and I was just thinking if other, you know, because this CNG would be like published uh, publicly, right? Users could use it to deploy GitLab. So I wonder if users who are deploying via, you know, these uh, containers want to use in-app mode, should we support that? Yeah. Actually, because it's a, uh, isn't it an environment variable ultimately? So we could still allow them to pass that to the main web service container and switch it on and still have the standalone action cable container. So maybe we could do that. Also- Yeah, my question was, I'm not too familiar with Docker Compose and like how it works, but like, I know we added an action cable container to Docker Compose, right? And the thing with in-app is like, we don't want to start that action cable service anymore, right? If in-app mode is enabled. So I'm not sure how to make that like conditional based on a config somewhere or like, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think- see what you mean, uh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think it would be to do with the, like how, how the containers are actually deployed. Like, so you would pass the environment variable into the container uh, or uh, like say it's a Kubernetes pod, you can, have some configuration there, switch it on in one container, like the web service container, and simply not deploy the action cable container. Yeah, I was thinking the same. I think it would be the same container, right? Because it's still the same app. It just follows a different initialization path. Uh, so I, I would imagine it would still be, yeah, so yes, it would, it would run action cable in standalone mode, but it, I think it can be the same container, right? Because it has the same kind of technical dependencies in that, in that sense, you know, it just needs to run the Rails app as we do in embedded or any other mode. So I don't imagine there would be a change required, but I, I might be wrong. Yeah, it's just yeah, so, for, for things. So like you're saying we, we don't need to change anything and then uh, the users that uh, deploy these containers just uh, pass this environment variable themselves? Is that? Um, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't want to make assumptions because I have not worked with the CNG stuff. Uh, I am just looking for the first time to be honest. Uh, so, but I, I'm just like, thinking generally in terms of how you would use a container to run this. So uh, it looks like, okay, so, so these are Docker files um, defining service containers, but it sounds like the actual services are still installed in that container via Omnibus, right? 
so so i'm wondering like, oh no these are different these are like totally okay. different uh, like um separate like work colors is a separate container like the rails app is in a separate container and uh, this is different from the um omnibus package where we deploy one container something like i forgot what the project is called or its well, name but yeah. so omnibus is has is not a container per se right it's just a way to package up your application so yeah. so uh whether you put that in a container or not doesn't really matter you can also just install it on your host machine via omnibus um, so by default we run a pipeline that creates a docker container from this um but um and, and honestly, like, you know, don't quote me on this. I mean, like I said, I'm just looking at this for the first time, but I, I, I it sounds like, I mean, it says here, um, build using the official source installation instructions with some Alpine specific fixes and some dependency compilation tweaks picked up from the Omnibus build packages. Yeah, it uses Omnibus uh, as a, a backup for services that it doesn't, okay. that aren't already in the CNG project. But okay, I think, no, we need to look into that more. Then, yeah. yeah, I think you can, I think with the web service container, which just um, wraps the, the Rails app, you could pass, there's maybe a small configuration to allow that value to be passed to the container, but I think it'd be a very small job. The one that might be a problem is the router, the container with the router in it, what's the name? Uh, Workhorse, was it? Um, at the minute, I think that it automatically with the last update automatically routes WebSocket traffic to the action cable um, to the action cable container which if you're running an app that traffic would need to be routed to the um, web service container instead but I still think it's quite a small small update by the way I think Heinrich you're right I, I'm just looking at the ERB that renders the docker file for GitLab Rails and it's not based on the bus it's basically like from source yeah what it, what it said so it just downloads GitLab <laughs> and sets everything up manually. So, so yeah, you're right. So we would probably have to change it if we wanted to control that via an environment variable somehow. Yeah, that would be the main thing and the workhorse change instead of like proxying to the cable container. It would like just proxy to the same Rails container. Yeah, I think I think it would be the same container. It would probably it would just be the GitLab Rails container, I would imagine, but we would have to make sure that you can uh, yeah, enable or disable uh, action cable via an environment variable. Yeah, I think the thing here is like you configure it once. I'm not sure how you deploy the CNG thing, right? But you set one setting once and it, um, it configures the corresponding settings, right? Like adds the environment, environment variable to GitLab Rails and then changes how GitLab uh, workhorse proxies, you know, you don't want the user to be configuring these separately, right? Because... Yeah, I'm actually thinking as well that the if we want this on another non-production environment like staging, Marin was saying that they want to use Kubernetes for staging as well. So if we want to run it in app in any other environment, we're going to have to do this work anyway. So it might be worth... I'll look into this anyway because I did the containerization work for action cable originally for the standalone so i'll look at um i'll revisit that mr and see if uh if there's a quick change that can be made to run it in app hopefully there is uh cool. we're, we're pretty much over time but henrik you had the last item yeah i was just, it's nothing urgent but i was just wondering like um getting extra fields real time in the sidebar would be like a front end only work because right now we're just sending the WebSocket message that the issue changed, you know, when anything in the issue changed, right? So we're sending more than we need to and the front end just needs to react to it, right? Right now it only reacts uh, um, by querying the assignees, although it reacts every time. Every, every time anything changes, it like queries actually, but then it only queries assignees. So if it just, if you just add a query for labels, for example, or like some other thing in the sidebar, then that's basically making the other parts of the sidebar real time. So, and the other, my, I was only thinking of this is because it's related to how we were like going to deploy this, right? Or tell users about it. It's kind of a weird thing to say like, oh, assignees are now real time. It's like, it's a super small thing, like maybe to a user and like, a real the, the side, sidebar is real time it's kind of better like message to users or like you know from a marketing perspective 
yeah <laughs> fully fully agreed with that like um i don't see any additional complexity from doing other uh parts of the sidebar as well we already have the graphql queries for all parts of the sidebar just not mutations that's only queries that really matter so um yeah that gets a big thumbs up for me like well i would suggest yeah, like, up to donald there. i guess yeah it's yeah. not here but yeah yeah all right cool uh, we're out of items, unless anyone has anything else. Oh, okay. Um, hopefully the demo brings in the audience for this video. Like That would be great. Uh, thanks for your time, and uh, have a great day.